hear me? No, now I'm connected, thanks. Uh, I'm going to take you uh, on a journey with a title of that. And this is something that you probably, you get information, it's particularly directed to the students here, uh, about game mechanics, programming, everything like that. But how is the life of a game developer? So 17 of journey with me now. That was the button. Uh, before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about me, because who I am, I cannot tell you everything, uh, but a little bit how, how the game parts work there. That will actually decide and show what I'm doing afterwards. So even though I look like 25, I'm 48 this year. Uh, so when I was six years old, I saw Space Invaders, and then my life changed. I was like, I didn't see the pixels. This ugly, it was beautiful to me though, these ugly pixelated uh, alien ships. I saw interactivity, I get hooked totally, directly. So when I was six years old, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. And that was not rock. It was games. A uh, little bit of background. I got a, that was a console at an airport when I was six. I, I don't know how, but I managed to get my mother to slot in the Swedish crowns. Do you need to play that game? And I uh, managed to reach up to the game and play it too with my brother. And uh, I got my first from my father. He was in England. So he shipped all over one of the first, like it was seven games on it, and everything was Pong. There, there different versions of Pong. But it had a really cool light gun, and I was hooked for that. And my first real computer. I think it was pretty much when a Commodore 64 came out. I don't know if I was like 12 or 14 or something by then. And uh, that was something for me, the problem solving part, I got hooked. I got problems with insomnia myself. And I'm not the person that lies down on a beach to rest or a bed. <laughs> I need to do something else with my brain to get it to relax. Games are perfect for that. And I need to get the challenge too, so programming was pretty much interesting for me. I played 3,000 games, everything store-bought. <laughs> There's a lot of piracy on the <laughs> Condor 64. But uh, I tried pretty much all genres and I, I started with a pretty much casual game, Space Invaders. Then got hooked more and more, started playing different genres, and uh, very quickly they ended up where all end up, usually, hardcore games. Back in school, and that's important because what, what I'm talking about soon, where I ended up in all this, is was, uh, I'm a person that cannot sit by. I question everything. If you say something, yeah, you, you must be ready to have an answer. Why is it like that? And I was not accepted in school, so I got thrown out. And I looked like a preppy boy back then. <laughs> then I created a rebel. And that rebel started wearing some denim jackets with Saxon and Judas Priest on it, had a hair growing out, metal spikes and shit. Thanks, school. <laughs> and uh, whatever I did, back then we had an incredible computer from Luxor called the uh, ABC80. Anybody heard about that? Some, some, yeah. You're old. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that was a Z80 processor-based processor computer. And uh, 
when I finished school, they had said 800. That was still black and white monochrome computer. But all my choices in school was based on my hobby there, programming. When I finished school, I started working with programming and computers with, uh, the, for the government, just to get close to them, and I hated it. It was the worst shit I ever done in my life. It was not creative at all, and it was boring, sitting typing, data, controlling databases for, I will not say what part of the government it was, so perhaps somebody wanna work there, so. But uh, later on, I was talked into. They were, when I was changing computers, I was changing programming language. So I started with basic, but I was, no, basic's not my thing. I need more speed. So I quickly went over to machine language, uh, an assembler. And then you had to change. Every time you change a computer, you have to change the processor or different. So. So I know a lot of languages, and my friends that have some companies that I, we need somebody that knows how to program. Can't you come and do this? Come teach. There's some companies here. And I know. Oh no, no, no. You see, I, I'm an introvert. I don't like to stay, be on stage. I hate stuff like that. So, but I accepted it, and I took off my leather coat, my boots, and my studded metal braces, and I actually put on like a suit almost, still had my long hair, and I had my first uh, 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 educational freelance job with a company called Know It. Have you heard about that? Swedish company. And uh, it was Java. Java just came out, and I was teaching programmers that work for five years Java, and I just learned it the week before. So these guys were looking me in the eye. They're like, what the fuck had a cat dragged in here? But I just continue, like, stressed out, standing in front of them, and I just continue. After 10 minutes, they're like, wow, this is cool. And then, look behind the look of it. So next day I came with leather coat, Doc Martens, studded <laughs> metal belts and everything. So I, yeah, they actually hired me later on to be their internal uh, educator too. So that's a little bit background. When others started, uh, my friends went over to start Starbreeze, some dice and stuff like that. I didn't think my hobby would be where I wanted to work. There was not that many companies back then either. So that's where I started myself, with education. And I started uh, educating uh, companies. I love that. If so, if I had a, a grade below five, and I could get a four, for example, even I did a best job because of the AC not working or the food at lunch was not good enough. That taught me to really take care of all the small details myself. And that was really useful for me when I was starting up my companies. And I got 1999, I was uh, at a company uh, the, and I said, like, you've done so much free, uh, uh, freelance work here now, so we have to hire uh, you, and we don't hire any teachers. You have to start your company. I'm like, no, I'm a working class son, I'm not a company. I don't know how, but they talked me into it. And the word spread around. I got offers all over. When my name was on a contract, uh, back in these years, I don't know exactly, early 2000, was a lot of unemployment-related uh, education. It's like women that's uh, 40 that never touched a computer, learned them to 
be programmers and stuff like that. I have so much programming oriented. So when my name was on one of those, the people got to work. And it was a lot of money too. I didn't stop work. So if they needed me more than eight hours per day, some more money in my pocket. So it was more than I ever had before. And I was feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, should I be a Buddhist monk or a capitalist pig? I was actually talking so much about that. My brother helped start the first Shaolin temple in, in Europe, in Gothenburg. <laughs> a very convincing guy. Or an intern or something. But what I did instead was I took those money and I started Disciples of the Machine. Disciples of the Machine, that's my whole concept. I want to hit China. 1999, 2000. I, want, I was interested, can I get a few cents from each pl player that will come in China? Then I'm going to be rich. And uh, to do that, I need to do something new. I do, free to play. And uh, because all of the piracy problems they have there, I have to control the logic on the server side. And my competition, massive multiplayer online games back then was Ashram's Cult, Ultima Online, EverQuest, all three role-playing game, grinding games. You have one, you don't have the other one. It takes too much time. So I need to be in between there. I do need to do totally opposite of what they're doing. They're selling boxes in the shops. Digital distribution before Steam. We build a system for that. And I cannot afford marketing. We're a small company. We spend almost everything on development. You need to spend more on marketing. We cannot do that. So it's a viral marketing system 14 years ahead of Facebook. That do not work. I didn't know that. You cannot create something that big if you're only a developer. I know introvert developers, too, that don't go out and speak to people and sell. And we did a, what was popular in Asia. Nobody knew what happened in Korea, China back then. But in Japan, it was uh, Pokemon and uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! and uh, big manga robots. So we did a trading card game around that. That was the game. Build all the engines, all the shops, digital distribution si system, payment system, everything. Uh, and we're coming out trying to sell that to the market. What do you think they say? The publishers we need to work with, the marketing guys. They're like, how the fuck do you monetize something that's free? We don't believe in digital distribution. So we did a second try, starting running out of money. We need to do something quick. We did something that's interesting perhaps for the publisher. This time we don't do all the technology ourselves. So what we did, we hooked up a one-man army in America. He's working for it now. He was doing a per pixel shader engine. It wasn't the best engine, but uh, it was a great job. He was like a whiz, whiz kid. That, what he was producing one day, the other produced it here. So that engine could be used, a per pixel shader engine, it was so we can, for, for, for the first time, get the effects that you're walking around with a torch and you get something screaming or rushing up at you. So we can work with darkness and light and shadows. So I wanted to do a zombie game. Back then it was only Resident Evil, pretty much, that we're doing zombies. And we did a Pulp Fiction-like story with four different, everybody loved the story, said, wow, this narrative's totally different. Nobody had done everything like that. But we don't believe in zombies. Zombies never going to work. And we are developers, so we need to listen. We need to work with these guys. At least we thought. The, the other data craft I have there was my private company, a one-man show. But uh, now going up to the next type of company, 
and uh, I don't know, is the public incorporated in um, English? I don't know the word exactly there. We had to shut down Disciples of the Machine in 2006 because nobody believed in our ideas. We couldn't get anyone to go into that. And uh, Oh, gives up World of Warcraft drowned. Yeah, I was actually doing the Swedish thing. If you shut down your company, then you become an alcoholic. Or play World of Warcraft at elite level for six months until somebody, it was my wife, but she didn't slap me. She like, hey, took a look at that. This is an office building, very cheap. <laughs> so, okay, what am I doing? I'm sitting here playing, uh, feeling sorry for I can do that again. It's not us that's wrong with. The game industry full is idiots. So let's work with other d industries. We took our knowledge and we went into uh, uh, the co commercial agency, like web development, and advertisement and stuff like that. Take that technology that we know about, make some money from that. So we're up again. And that actually worked without salespersons. So we had one guy. We thought he was the most non-shy guy, least introvert. So he was selling this uh, on checking the uh, internet for work and then calling them up and say, we come down and show what we can do. We get going again. Positive results, and uh, then a company called EA dies. It's like, hey guys, wasn't it you that were doing like free to play back in the days? Yeah, can you come and help us? We're setting up a new studio. So I was with them as the only external consultant when I was setting up the EA Easy Studio. The first week, it wasn't even named. After two years later, it was named EA Easy. I skipped that. They didn't know what they were doing. Um, but they saw our talent. We'll be building all this technology. We're working all this year together. So they're like, hey, guys, can't you come help us? We're working with something here that's really cool. And it was actually a, a game called uh, Battlefield Bad Company. Um, Battlefield Bad Company came with something new to really put, put Sweden and DICE on the map. And that wasn't not the game. It was the engine, the Frostbite engine. So we helped them with the Frostbite engine. We said never again. But then we were back again. <laughs> and 2009, I went to GDC in San Francisco. I was thinking I'd get like four people and perhaps a stray dog to come to my meetings at the Game Connection. So I had 43 slots. I get 75 meeting requests from all the big companies. And they, they had seen Zynga. They had seen the Facebook companies, everything. Playfish, everything. They say like, why didn't we listen to you? Yeah, why didn't you? Yeah, we would be bigger and Senga. Yeah, you would. <laughs> so, uh, what's next? They ask me. What do you predict is the next for the future? I predict hardcore games on mobile. You fucking kidding us? We will not do anything like that again. They're not listening. <laughs> and every paradigm shift like this, when, it go, when something like Facebook comes in, the old companies that didn't understand anything, the idiots, they're actually making no money at all. They were not prepared on this. They didn't see it. In 2007, we went to that, we're not adopting anymore. We're not trying to do something that we think the market, we do whatever we want. And just the rest. So we were actually, we get challenged. They say, 
If you do hardcore on mobile, you're gonna get 5,000. And that was like Tapjoy, that was really big. It was one of the first ad companies that were like, we are the kings, we know everything about mobile. But you get 5,000, that's nothing more than that. I said, I get 50,000. Then I have a new system, a viral system, a referral system, that can get that up to five, five, not five, five times. So I get 250,000. Uh, some stress and some bad, we're trying to do marketing ourselves, uh, writing a press release and it sucked. So we, we throw them away. We, we're not doing the press release, no marketing, no nothing. We just dump the game out on the market. 1.5 million downloads without any marketing. No features, no nothing. Just organic people spreading the word. So, we, okay. And that was just a test for us. We're still li listening to this, like, perhaps they're right. Perhaps we shouldn't spend all this time. Let's do a test. And the test worked, so. And to bring in money, we not only help uh, EA, the reputation of our skills spread around, we help Go Technology. That's a startup company uh, now financed by uh, more and more. Uh, that's Kai He, the former CEO of Robio's investment company, and doing HTML5 WebGL. And yeah, I think uh, roughly a year we helped them there. And uh, we also helped King now with the default engine and their first game there, the Blossom Blast Saga. And that's we get some money in so we can do whatever shit we want, not have to care about the no people. And uh, I'm skipping that part but, uh, out of possible legal problems afterwards. Um, yeah. Uh, and the next two, <laughs> it's a little bit talk about publishers. Um, you can uh, meet me for a beer later tonight and I can tell you, but perhaps not in front of a camera here, I get sued again. <laughs> 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 I, we got problems with some new recruits. Um, I got a feeling myself that I'm self-taught. I am actually started, I started the first games school, higher education in the world myself in Kronfors in 2000. Uh, but I'm self-taught everything. You heard my background history. So whenever I see talent that don't fit in, people walking like this with the air earphones on, shy guys, girls with talents, I try to take them in and try to build them up, make a job for them. I spend too much money while we're trying to survive at the same time, ourselves. So we had a problem there we pretty much last year where they didn't learn. And I paid for three years uh, salaries. And it's like, now we're dropping the chance here. So you, you can be very kind and good at heart, but wait until you have the money to spend that. So last year I was almost back down on my knees Yeah, we, we went with a publisher later on. They got 600,000 of the hardcore game out in three weeks, and then they shut down. They, uh, their company, they shut down their company. So 2008, new regions, I'm not gonna go into this. I don't know how much time, but I think I've overdone all the uh, presentation of all the companies here. This is uh, the identity, the vision out, all the companies. Datacraft, that I mentioned, was my first company. That has pretty much become a, a holding company now. And the structure is the other companies under that, uh, sister companies. That's one of the siblings, one of the sister companies to the others I'm gonna tell you about. 
corn crow is one, corn nugger is one, two. And here is where we put still, <coughs> where, we, where we put the uh, web part. Never give up. If you make something good and you get famous, but that, that even if it's boring, keep it still. You never know when you want to pull it out of your pocket and make some extra money. And uh, what we did in this company, we started in Stockholm first, like I saw, told you, that we could just called around looking on the web, looking for work for higher stuff. But it ended up, we are actually doing work directly with the US agencies. And they said like, okay, we cannot handle that. Let the Swedes do it. That was, let the Swedes do it. So we did uh, like uh, Facebook campaigns for NHL, uh, for Ford USA. We had some like uh, the, the whole with blogs and everything, the whole comp campaign that we did. Toyota, we did a lot of work for Toyota. There was a, a Toyota social networks inside of social networks. So we hacked Facebook. <laughs> uh, and uh, we did like games for them where you can get free gasoline and stuff like that directly if you play that on the internet. And uh, the cool thing about that was, once again, if you get new people coming in, it is not at our level of experience, so I can send them out to King, EA, Google, whatever, Activision. Uh, then I need to train them myself. And it's not good doing what I'm doing, just putting them on internal projects that may fail if they do not ma manage it. It's easier, it's easier to make money. HTM coding and designing stuff for uh, agencies. It's easier to get that money in. And we get so much money in, so we can pre probably for one hour, we can support three other hours of staff. So, and that's the easy part to get them to train because my philosophy is always that technology should never decide. Design must decide everything. That's why we need to be best in technology. And if you combine a lot of languages and techniques, there's nothing is impo impossible. So you have a crazy ideas, then you can create it. So that's a good place to put beginners at. Uh, and a good thing here, more positive things like I've been bringing up all the time. You know the American economy went down. And without any salesperson ourselves, we were just relying on the contacts we had. Uh, they lost job and it's still not up to the level where they can ship it out to the Swedes again. I'm back, Corn Crow Games. Corn Crow Games now, when we're talking, last year we were trying to get rid of people. I was, <laughs> oh, that sounds nasty. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, those that didn't work. In Sweden, we have problems. We can just kick, fire people directly. So it may take some time. We have to scale down. Money getting short. And uh, some companies stealing people from us. It was like the worst year. But at the same time, it was the best year. We have reached where we finance our own massive multiplayer online game. Our system, we were ready to hit the world. So. Uh, I spent pretty much, and I just back three weeks ago, one and a half year now on the road. And uh, meeting investors, meeting publishers, and, uh, and, and trying to get them to understand that the ne next thing is really hardcore, but it's not that hardcore that you, you're looking at right now. It's even more hardcore. So we're doing something like Destiny combined with Skyrim or mobile running down to an iPhone 4S and up to infinity. And we shape out the whole company, we mold into this. We say that uh, directional company, it should be cross platform, mobile first. If you can do it good and it works good and looks good on mobile, why not add everything else? You should not be limited to do 
a special system here. So we're doing a dungeon crawling game, and we actually had a survival and crafting game. Uh, they said managed to beat us. It was an idea I had in 2010. I, I, these are nothing until you execute them. So I was like, yeah, we do it when we can afford on PC. And then they said, Come, oh shit, let's give up. That's the game I wanted to make. <laughs> so uh, they said, if you haven't heard about they said, the, uh, the survival and crafting games very popular right now, Ark, uh, Rust, games like that. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So, but let's do it on mobile, looking as good as PC. Yeah, so we, I was out promoting two type of game, especially checking because the Western world has been on casual, and still on casual and mid-core, super seller making money. Some other companies, I won't say their name, are losing money doing casual. But in the East, it's already, it's already shift. They don't touch casual games, the big publisher in, in East. And they just changed. 2005 to 2000, uh, 2015, 2016. In 2015, October, then it's changed totally. So they say, yeah, we only do hardcore now. And they are ahead. We started in 1999. How many did free-to-play, massive multiplayer online games in 1999? Not many in the Western world. And nobody know about the Eastern world. Korea did it. They started in 1999, too. So they have influenced the market. And their market are exactly where we are right now. So we just learned how to do investment. I was thinking I could do it the traditional way, like I learn everything. I just go in and talk to a guy, and uh, like uh, an investment company, and I, like, yeah, I, I want to learn how to do that. You're wasting my time. Go away. So it took a couple of weeks to get the knowledge of that, but now we started talking to uh, investment companies. But here's a cool thing about idiots again. China, they look at our game and they say, I say, Western, look, this will not work. <laughs> they will always do that. And I was like, do you like the Lords of the Ring? Yeah. But that is a Western look. And our game looks like that. Yeah, 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 you're right, yeah, yeah. Well, of Warcraft is that popular in China? Yeah, that is a Western look. Oh yeah, yeah. I see what you're talking. Oh, I see what you're talking about now. Yeah, yeah. I, I send it back to the test guys. Yeah. <laughs> and the same with the first person will not w uh, work. That's because nobody is doing first person right now. They're doing precision based. We're doing tactical based first person. If you don't know what that, that is, I carry it. A demonstration in my pocket later, so we can see that. And yeah, this year, I founded yet another company. <laughs> I remember, I was like, no, I cannot start a company. That's all. But that was fun. I like that. I like cr creating company and opportunities. And as we are changing Corn Crow into now building, uh, being. Uh, ready for investments, we have to have very hard lines what we're following. And uh, uh, our games there should be, like I said, mobile first, cross platform. But it's always about playing games on mobile or cross platform, parenthesis, uh, with other people or against other people. So that's, that's the philosophy. Everything else. The corn crawl, we've done a lot of experience. Trying to think like, huh, oh, can, we, can we do that? They said that didn't work, so we need to do that type of game, like the zombie games, casual game, and stuff like that. Uh, so everything we have there, we, we're shipping over. So this is new corn crawl. And I need to have something on the side to play with, otherwise I get bored. I mean, corn crawl is pretty much being constructed now, so that I, my brain should not be needed in the future. But don't say that to the investors yet. 
And what we're doing now, we're actually switching everything. So we have some cash from always going bankrupt last year. It just changed. So now we have some cash. And we're working on Battlefield 1. So too, I can announce that, no, helping them. So. so we're actually taking some money and investing in our own game here, a game company. And uh, I have a new little idea here, or a new development method of hardcore games, getting uh, turn-based, story-driven hardcore games down to a three or four months cycle. And uh, we tried to, we're on the first month now, and it's working really good. And uh, if I manage that, low risk. And it's a very good introduction place for new programmers too, so. Okay. And we're looking to publish ourselves, market ourselves, everything ourselves. What's the conclusion? I haven't checked you, oh, oh, time-wise, yeah. Uh, conclusion here, yeah, the game industry truly is full of idiots. You. <laughs> What happens if you listen to all these people? Uh, yeah, nothing gonna happen. All the changes you see is never gonna happen. I don't say that you never should listen to people, but remember that the publishers and investors, they are probably not as good as you at understanding the game business. They understand what they are uh, good at. And they're not finding the next new thing that will change the market. They're good at reading reports and stuff like that. So if you come with a copy of another copy, then they probably will understand that. And uh, you heard, we've been going through tough times all the time. You should probably give up for so many. I think I said that three times to my co-founder last year. Shall we go up now? Should we be like normal people and get real jobs? Like, no, we're done at 17 years, we're up again soon, so. So, but always remember to keep the core team. You need to survive. You need to find these uh, where you can go and not lose the important people to other companies. But if you lose them, lose them to the good company. We understand that it's a little bit like a loan. When you're up again, yeah, you can get them back. So, understand the market was something I was talking to to the, uh, everybody was in uh, when I was in Jari for Jari for two, the second year students here yesterday. Uh, if you understand the market yourself, you might know much more about the games than the publishers and the investors do. And remember about the China, when I was talking about that. Do that as an example. I can, do I have the time? I have a quick, yeah. Uh, this uh, company, I don't say what company, but it's doing a game called World of Tanks. So they, and they were looking at the shit I was going around with. I said, yeah, first person doesn't work in China. We tried that. Uh, and uh, yeah, this market doesn't work at all. And, so. and I was like, yeah, OK, fuck them. But then, no, no, let's educate them. I said, I told them a little bit. I said, you're thinking wrong on this. You're thinking wrong on this. You're thinking wrong on this. Let's meet the GDC. And I will explain how this industry works. And that's pretty cocky, right? But I have to deliver too. And it brought one of the senior bosses, not the highest, but very high, and the most experienced senior producer. They were challenge me and everything, try and crush my ideas. And I just fought them back with the reason. And I said, can we meet next time too? And now we understand, it works. 
if you do it like that. So don't be stubborn, but know that you can know more than them. But you have to reason. You have to tell them how it works, too. Uh, did you turn distribution change everything? We were pretty much not prepared when uh, everything went in our direction with the digital distribution. Uh, but now you can easily, quickly go to market, do that, go test your ideas. Because if they don't work, it's not the publishers anymore that can kill you. It's only you can, that can kill yourself. If your idea sucks, then you know it quickly. So when you start up a company, try to aim big, yeah? You want to make this next, I don't know, but it's big. It takes so many years, so you're going to be a gray hair and everything. But yeah, have that idea, it's OK. But see to it that you can handle every step. And every step you sit down, see to it that it's secured, and then take the next one. So have something on the side. Put up the plan. Not just how the game work, how you should survive, too. What happened if this game? That's something you learn by the experience we got. You need to have all these plans. You have, need to have things on the side. Otherwise, you're, you're dead. And this was, it's not one game business. You need to survive 15 years. You need to do 15 games before you make Angry Birds. Right? That's what they're not telling you. It's like, oh, look at me, we made it's game, and we're a million. Yeah, you did 30 that didn't sell. Can you talk about this? No, no, no don't want to talk about those. Uh, and if you're going with a partner, actually put some time. Most of what we lost a lot of time, that we didn't put the time and pressure, we were too kind, on the partners, like publisher, distributors, and stuff like that, to actually get uh, to feel if they are actually thinking. Because if you're very good introvert developers, you don't have to be that, but if you're really good, you have to be that. <laughs> uh, if you're not, the charm the pants of you, just being friendly, <laughs> a little bit social, like you believe everything they say. Spend a little bit more time. See if that's the true people. Are they actually going to give you? Are they the right one for that type of game that you're delivering? Don't, don't jump. You're never in that rush. You think you are in that rush. You're never in that rush. You can destroy everything you built. They can destroy everything. It's better if you destroy it then and not work with them. And uh, it's a hobby. It's a passion. It's a dream, but in the end, it's all about money and business to most. Some succeed anyway. Some don't want to have it, only money-based. But remember that when you're talking to partners. They don't see your game. They see, they see the dollars afterwards. Thank you very much. That was everything from me. If you want to get in touch with me, that, that's one of my emails. It's pretty much the same. You just change it to Koninger or whatever company you wanted to go through. Do we have time for some questions? Do we have any questions? You have to beep. You're so many people. I don't see where you are. No questions? It's pretty much me. I drop like 10 names, and i like, what do we want to do now? Uh, Datacraft, we were still like very nerdy. Like there was a like, combination of with craftsmanship in computers, and then we just went downhill from that. Corn Crow is actually from our mascot. And, uh, you can see if I can run. Uh, you're probably not going to see my business card all, all over there, but it's a scarecrow. 
he, he is a scarecrow. He's not a scarecrow. He is a corn crow. <laughs> so, and the corn again. He was like, we need to have some heritage to Sweden. If it, anyone from Iceland here? Not. Konunger, still used. But in the old age, old Swedish, Konunger is meant king. So sometimes I just, this is on video, right? No. no. Yeah. I stopped there. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? You, yeah. Should I be on honest or? Be yeah. <laughs> uh, Kickstarter doesn't work at all if you're not very, very famous personality. And we don't have that much famous personality in games, actually. You don't become the front man singer. It's just a few of them. Uh, it's going to work for them always. But uh, I think Kickstarter you should use for the money that it's supposed to be. But if you're building like all the presence and underground marketing, it should be one of the strategies you should use along with others for marketing. Do you understand what I'm talking about there? Yeah. yeah. Kind of. yeah. Um, SSL, they don't have that famous developers, right? Sorry? Uh, SSL. Uh, I, I, I don't hear the name. I'm a, yeah, but FTL was two years ago, like, or one or one. Oh, one you're talking half. about um, the state of it now? Yeah, I, I now. Thought. Now, the market for Kickstarter has changed. If you're doing a board game, card game, a physical game, I think it probably work perfect to get the money you need. But if you're trying to get, like, how much you need? You're four people or five people or six or seven? Let's say ten people. You need ten million Swedish crowns. You're not going to get that. So you can use it along with the green lighting and everything else that you're using to get like a, a forum of people that are interested in the product that you can use in your marketing. But I, I, I'm not seeing it myself as a means to get the money in. No, sorry. OK. Any more? Do we have time? Yeah, um, you said we were working on a tactical or strategic game before. Are you allowed to talk about that, or uh, is that outside no. the scope of this? <laughs> no, I cannot talk about that. Uh, sorry, it sounded so interesting. <laughs> I want to. Give me a drink, and then we can, but I cannot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm a person that keeps my secret inside, no. Mm -hmm. But I cannot talk about that, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. So let's wait to the drinks there. So. Righty. <laughs> And it supports tech. I'm talking about it anyway a little bit. So. <laughs> I didn't say this. I'm going to say that now. You want to make a game, but think about market. Always start with market. And when you start with market, and if you're creative type of group, you probably have a lot of ideas. So we're making an engine inside another engine uh, that could work for uh, tactical and strategic games. But now we need to take a, dr a drink, if I should <laughs> say anything more there. Two more questions. I think we have down here. Um, yeah, would you recommend working on um, other aspects that aren't necessarily the passion project in order to fund the passion project? Because I've sort of, um, I really identify with, with what you're saying that the industry 
will support you only once they see that it, it works. If you have an idea yeah. that doesn't fit in with whatever the um, the sort of mainstream acceptance of what you should be making is, everyone's going to tell you no. Yeah. But then as soon as it sells, as soon as you're notch, then everyone's like, oh, we've supported you. You know, everyone wants a piece of you. Everyone wants, um, mm. is suddenly your best friend once they've seen that it, that it makes money. And it's only after. Mm. Um, but you need the money, obviously, first to start. Um, and so th that, I feel, kind of um, ties in with when, when, when um, you try to show that your game or that your idea is marketable. Um, some people will say, well, but now you're just concerned about the money and it's supposed to be a passion project. But if you talk about it like a passion project, then they say, oh, you're a foolish idealist. You need to suck about the market. And so you get hit like kind of at both ends of yeah. the. That, that's really good. That's uh, a little bit related to everything that I've been talking about yeah. right, right now. The passion pro uh, project that you're doing is probably something that will change the industry too, if it succeeds. And what I have said about the publisher, what, what is the title of my whole, what's the title of yeah. my whole presentation? Do you think you're gonna, if you can find it yourself, it's fine, but you have to do it yourself then. They're gonna knock on your door afterwards when you succeed, like, yeah. And this is the guys you see out there, the ones that succeed, so, wow, it's so easy to do Minecraft and yeah, I make that much, no. It's easier to go win on a lottery. And it's the same much of strat strategy and planning. So if you do your planning there and you see that this dream project that I want to make, I cannot support it right now. Then you should quickly find ways to support it if you have that passion for something. And that's pretty much a little bit what I want to say to you. This, uh, this business is a lot of passion driven. For me, it is. It's so much passion. I, I don't want to do anything else. I cannot think about anything else since I was six years old. So I'm, I'm going to try to survive. Not with, by selling myself to uh, everyone that's uh, trying to jump me or hump me, uh, but <laughs> keep, 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 keep my like, uh, ethics intact. Uh, still do get the money I want so I can do my dream project. I believe in that, so. I hope I answered a little bit. Yeah. yeah. The last question, if we have one. Have a time? Oh, there. Hello. Um, I'm Hi. just wondering uh, what, uh, how do you think uh, games will look like in the future? What do you think of the development? I think I'm on a <laughs> panel games. about that tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Am yes. I? Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm on a panel on that tomorrow. So, uh, can we do him too? <laughs> <I'll sorry. Yeah. laughs> okay, then, then I think we're finished. So, thank you everybody for listening to my ramblings.